What went wrong with the Luna 25? The Russian spacecraft crashed on the moon instead of making a soft landing at the South Pole. As other countries compete in the race to space, what lessons are being learned from the failure? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. It was a mission to elevate Russia's standing both at home and in space, but the Luna 25 spacecraft failed to stick its landing. The crash is raising questions about Moscow's space programme, particularly as Russia becomes more isolated from the West. Competition is relentless. Alongside Russia, India, China and the US are all looking to explore whether there's water and other resources on the South Pole of the Moon. So, how big a setback has the Kremlin suffered? And what does it mean for rival programmes and business ventures out of this world? We'll get to that with our guests in just a moment, but first, here's Katya lopez Hodiyan. It was Russia's first mission to the moon in almost 50 years. But the Luna 25 lunar lander failed to live up to its name. It crashed onto the surface of the moon, exposing challenges, perhaps, beyond Russia's space program. Western sanctions imposed on Russia uh, prevented them access to very high-performance microelectronic components, which they need for their spacecraft. Because the supply chain has collapsed, they're having to either bypass it in some other way or build instrumentation at home. The race is about space exploration and prestige, but also about business. Scientists believe parts of the moon may hold deposits of ice for drinking water and other precious elements that in the future could be mined by astronauts. And competition is growing. India is expecting its own spacecraft, Chandrayaan-3, to do what the Russians couldn't and land on the lunar south pole on Wednesday. Along with the U.S., China and Russia, India is also spending big on expanding its reach in space. It's a moment of glory for all of us. It's a moment of glory for India. And I think a moment of destiny for all of us, that we are part of the history in making. Collaboration between the Russian space agency Roscosmos and some of its counterparts like NASA were broken off after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Some analysts say the Luna 25 crash underscores the decline of Russia's space power since the glory days of the Soviet Union, when Sputnik 1 blasted off in 1957, the first satellite ever to orbit the Earth. It's not uncommon for space missions to fail, but Russia needed a win as a sign of defiance and national pride. Katia lopez Odoyan for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests now. And in Chevy Chase, Maryland, we have Steve Marin, a retired astronomer at NASA and astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Steve is also author of the guidebook Astronomy for Dummies. In the Indian capital, New Delhi, is retired Army Lieutenant General Anil Kumar Bhatt. He's also Director General of the Indian Space Association. And in Philadelphia, in the US, we have Derek Pitts. He's Chief Astronomer and Planetarium Program Director at the Franklin Institute. A very warm welcome to all of you. Derek, first of all, the big question, of course, that everyone's asking today is what happened? What went wrong with the Luna 25? Well, for the reports that we've had so far, there's an indication that there was a malfunction with a landing maneuver that the Russians were attempting to begin the landing sequence. Uh, They were moving from one orbit level down to another orbit level. And uh, as far as we know, either the rocket fired too long, fired too little, or fired in the wrong direction. And uh, the result was a crash onto the surface. So unfortunately, that last landing maneuver, it seems, did not work. Mm. Steve, just how embarrassing is this for Moscow? I mean, it's a far cry, isn't it, from the sophisticated space program of the former Soviet Union? Uh, it certainly is. They they landed uh, uh, a number of times in the, in the past on the moon. They landed successfully, the only ones to do it, 10 times uh, 
on the surface of Venus, and the crash comes at just uh, an embarrassing time because another nation is about to try to do the same thing. But in fairness, people, nations, companies crash on the moon all the time. There have been two crashes on the moon in April alone of this year by two different nations. We'll get to that other nation in just a moment. It is, of course, India. Uh, Steve, why do you think at this particular time it might have happened? Do you think we should be looking at uh, geopolitical reasons? We should be looking at the state of Russia's economy, the Ukraine war, all of these issues. Do you think they play into Russia's space program? I, I think they do. Maybe Ukraine, not so much, because this lunar uh, attempted landing has been planned for a long, long time. But... Uh, uh, the, at some point, what was the Soviet program became the, the Russian program, lost a lot of funding, lost political emphasis. The truth that uh, most of the early space programs were intended for geopolitical pre prestige more than science. And so they haven't had the steady funding that uh, NASA and some other nations have had for many years and get practice in building spacecraft flying missions with all the latest technologies. Mm. They may be, the Russians also may be behind in some technologies, but also um, there are crashes and unexpected events that can occur to anyone's program. Okay, General Bats, let's get on to India. Sorry, just before we do, I can see, Derek, you want to say something. Do you want to jump in there? Laura, I was I was going to point out Hello. that in addition to that, you know, the, the other thing is that uh, it has not helped Russia, the Russian space program at all. The embargoes that have been imposed on Russia since the beginning of the conflict uh, with Ukraine. So one one result of that is the lack of supply of hardened electronics and very very reliable electronics that are needed to sustain spacecraft in the horrible environment of space. I mean. We don't think of uh, space really in the way that we should, which is it's not a benign environment at all. It's very, very difficult on electronics, and all of that makes this work difficult for any country. But if you don't have the components you need because of political embargoes, then that really does multiply uh, your chances that you might run into a problem. OK, well, let's move on to what we hope will be a more successful uh, operation in the next couple of days. General Bat. The spotlight is now on India, hot on the heels, of course, of Russia. Could be the first nation to land on the far side of the moon. Are you confident of success? Oh, uh, definitely after India has already had uh, two missions, Chandrayaan-1, which was a total success, Chandrayaan-2, which was partially successful, and of course, our land at that time crash landed. But the lessons learned from that I'm very sure have been picked up very well by our scientists. And this time, they have had all the fail-safe mechanisms put into it. They have learned the right lessons. And I'm very sure in next two days, we'll have a very good news when the Vikram lander lands at the moon. Yes, it's a tough call, but I'm so confident that this time, our scientists will do it. I suppose, of course, one of the key issues, differences here between yours and the Russian program is, as you say, this is the third time that you've been attempting this. You've had one success, one partial success, and this is all following on. You've learned a lot of lessons. The Russians, on the other hand, hadn't tried to land on the moon in 50 years. Oh, yes. Though, they, if you see in terms of record, they are one of the nations which has landed on the moon. But, yes, there's been a large gap. And it, at times... Maybe there is some loss of expertise. But the most important thing is, like one of my other fellow panelists has said, space is unforgiving. And any small mistake can lead to what a successful mission becoming unsuccessful. And that is what would have happened. And I guess that's what makes it so compulsive and so fascinating for so many people. Give us an idea, General Bat, of what Chandrayaan 3's mission is going to be on this far side, on the south pole of the moon. So, uh, presently, the stated mission is, and the most important is, a soft landing on the moon, mm -hmm. on the south side. The number two is, after the lander is landed there, uh, the rover will be tried out because the rover is also going along with the land lander called Pragyan. And also, there will be a number of scientific tests 
including the testing of soil and other scientific instruments which have been put there. Uh, just one more question to you, General Bat, before we move on to our other guests. India, of course, was the first to discover water on the moon some 10 years ago. That is a key issue, isn't it, on, uh, a reason for people to return there again and again. Do we have any idea how to extract water from the moon? No. Oh, well, I, uh, me not being a scientist would not be able to answer your question completely. But we, what, what we have learned from our first mission and what uh, the things are happening, we are expecting that on the southern side, we will find water. And that would be very important for future missions which go to the moon or maybe for exploration of all other uh, parts of space. OK, OK, let's bring in Steve then. Steve, what does happen when one does find water on the moon? What's, what's the next step? Well, the, the big step, uh, unfortunately, in the opinion of uh, some people who are concerned about preserving the lunar environment like a national park, uh, is that you, you find ways to exploit it. And why you, it's critical to find ice on the water, because I'm pretty sure there's no bottled water up there. There's no actual ocean uh, on the moon. There are no underground springs. It's going to be in the form of ice. There's some traces of water vapor because the ice uh, evaporates or sublimates. And uh, so you have to see exactly what form the ice is. Is it all tiny particles mixed up in the, uh, the lunar soil, which is uh, sharp and um, cutting particles, that dangerous to handle, let alone inhale, if they get in your, your lunar uh, pod. And so you have to see exactly what form it is and developed a technology that best extracts it, gets rid of the, filters out the, the, the rock particles and uh, turns it into uh, a liquid or, a, or a compressed gas. And you need this water because if you're going to have people working on the moon for more than a few days as they did when the NASA astronauts were there in the 1970s, They've got to have, they've got to have oxygen to breathe. They've got to have water to drink, and for other purposes. If you have almost any industrial process, or even just cooking, you need water. You can't bring it. You can bring it from Earth for a few days. You can't bring uh, enough to stay there for a month or two, or indefinitely, because for every pound of uh, water, you need many more pounds of rocket propellant, and then you have no. You need a, a rocket bigger than even Elon Musk uh, contemplates making. To, to develop the moon, to live on the moon, you need, you need water and oxygen. You can get the water from the ice. You can take some of that water and split it electrically into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen to breathe or to be used as the uh, oxidizer and rocket fuel to get you home or to go somewhere else on from the moon. So water is critical. Steve, do you think we should do this? Do you think we should exploit the water and the resources on the moon, or should we preserve the natural environment there? I think you can do both, as we do on Earth. Uh, the miners don't have a great record, and, I, uh, and there are people who fear they'll have a worse record on the moon where there's no local inhabitants to uh, have a picket line. Uh, but uh, it's it's almost inevitable. It may start because of political rivalry, but there are also resources there. One of the things hasn't been mentioned is the helium-3. That's a heavy and rare isotope of the gas helium. It's uh, apparently present in abundance in the lunar soil, where it's been trapped from the solar wind that beats down on the moon continuously. It doesn't beat down on the surface of the Earth because it's uh, deflected by the radiation belts, the, our magnetosphere. Helium-3 is uh, many physicists consider the ideal fuel for future nuclear fusion plants that might solve the energy problem on Earth if we survive the climate, climate uh, problems uh, in time. Right. Uh, Derek, Steve has brought up a lot of points there. A lot of valuable resources, firstly, that appear to be on the moon. 
Is there going to be a big question over who owns them, who has the rights to exploit them, and who can benefit from them? Well, first of all, who knew that the South Pole of the Moon was going to become so popular? It was the <laughs> discovery of uh, water there that really uh, started uh, started that part of the popularity of the moon. And uh, as Steve points out, this is incredibly important because of uh, the need for the resources to explore the rest of the solar system. But as far as ownership of the moon is concerned, you know, there have been uh, policies in place since the 1960s that talk about ownership. And uh, the intention was that the moon was going to be very much like uh, the research bases at Antarctica, where no one owns the moon or owns any of the planets. And so it really has been uh, brought down to who can get there first to exploit what resources are there. So I don't think that I don't think we're going to see anytime soon uh, any kind of uh, lease arrangements or any mm. kind of real estate sales of parcels of the moon or anything like that. But it all really comes down to who gets to where first to make okay. use of the resources available. And General Bat, with India at the moment leading that race, is this a conversation that's being had in New Delhi? I mean, why is the Prime Minister Narendra Modi making space exploration such a priority? You know, firstly, space is the ultimate in science. And fortunately for India, in the last 60 years, ISRO has kept us at the high table of the space-faring nations. Uh, one part of it is research and exploration and exploration of the universe, which is being led by ISRO. And the second part is the commercial part or the usage of space, which has now touched every life everywhere. The space now has become a necessary part, be it for communication, be it for remote sensing, be it for navigation. And along with what was led by governments previously, now the private sector has also become a co driver And uh, even our prime minister in 2020 uh, made this historical decision of opening space to private sector and our nascent industry in the private domain also now growing up. It is, isn't it? I mean, the, the, looking at the uh, private space or the space industry in India, the private startups, and they have doubled since 2020. Do they support the national program or are they in conflict with it, in competition with it? How does it all work? I mean, is everything, everyone working together in one great big cosmic happy family? Well, they are totally in coordination with our national program. In fact, uh, we've had one successful launch by a startup uh, sub-orbital launch, uh, and very soon they'll have an orbital launch. Uh, another company is waiting to make engines by 3D technology, 3D printing, a complete engine. And all they are being hand-holded -hold, by ISRO. It's, it's, it's a it's a win-win situation with cooperation between government agencies and private sector. Even okay. uh, some of our new startups who have been able to make satellites and launch them successfully have been provided all the support from the government and from ISRO. Okay, what we are looking India. at is a very- Derek, strong... you want to jump in there? Yes, yeah, so just um, let me point pardon? out that uh, with all due respect to with, with all due respect to all of the players in the in the space realm these days, uh, we also have to keep in mind that, you know, this is also a question of national pride for every country that's involved in this. And it's also a story about technological superiority. I think that uh, one of the th one of the things that drove the space race that has always driven space races is the desire to demonstrate a technological superiority that's held by a nation and thus you know is a is a great source of national pride so we can't leave out the fact that having that technological superiority in space also indicates points out and suggests to everyone else that you have a superior technology capability that may be beyond everyone else so that is also a very serious issue or consideration when we think about all the other parts and pieces of you know, wanted to do this space exploration and, you know, the all those all those altruistic pieces. They're nice and everything, but let's not forget the parts about uh, national pride and demonstration of technological superiority. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, that's a fair point, isn't it? And I think you, you 
brought this in at the beginning of the discussion, that there is this uh, sort of the parallel track of national ambition, national pride, technological uh, advancements, as Derek says, and science. Do these two tracks go hand in hand when it comes to exploring space? And then, of course, you've got the commercial aspects, too, or are they sort of in conflict with each other? There are individual, obviously, there's no more important, in some sense, satellite launcher than the comp private company SpaceX, uh, because it launches more satellites than uh, every year than uh, everybody else on Earth put together, I think. They don't launch more rockets than, I don't think, than China, but they launch rockets every week with dozens of satellites on board. The, uh, you get to the moon and nobody owns the place you're landing, nobody owns the place you're exploiting, everybody else has the right to land on there. The international uh, space agreements really were just say that other bodies in the solar system beyond Earth are com sort of common property. They don't lay down any principles. And if they did, it doesn't mean that uh, we or anybody else would always uh, would always uh, follow them. Your question is, whoever lands first near, sh near one of those craters uh, uh, near the South Pole of the Moon, where you've got continuous around the clock solar energy available on the rim of the crater, and continuous dark shadow in the bottom where you can where you can live uh, safely uh, and and mine your water. Uh, whoever lands there, what if somebody lands right next to them? Are they casting a shadow on their solar panel? Okay. Are they encroaching on uh, their limited deposit of ice? There's a lot of moon out there. There aren't a lot of known great places to land right now, and. Uh, Let's say that everybody's there in, in safe places, not interfering with each other in terms of the land they're, they're exploiting. What about communications with back to Earth? What about keeping time? Time runs faster on the moon than the same clock on the Earth. That's a problem that we're beginning to uh, worry about, to coordinate things. What about relaying communications? Does everybody have to have their own satellite relay satellites orbiting the moon and interfering with the radio telescopes, which astronomers hope will be put on the backside of the moon, which offers a unique opportunity to explore the early universe and listen in on uh, planets of other solar systems. There's, there, there needs to be a common infrastructure mm. and how you get that among rival nations and uh, neutral nations and private corporations driven by stockholders who may be benign or greedy. There's a lot of human problems to be solved, as I think Derek was indicating. Absolutely. And Derek, I just want to get, a, get in here before the discussion, before we run out of time for the discussion. Why, where is the U.S. in its space program? Why are we not seeing America, NASA, trying to land on the south side of the moon? Well, that is where we're heading. The uh, Artemis program that NASA has now undertaken and is, uh, you know, a third of the way into it for building new rocketry and building new capsules to land on the moon is planning to do its next uh, or, uh, lunar orbits in 2025, I think it is. And so they have plans to have boots on the moon in just a few years right after that. So they have a program, NASA has a program set up, a program working and operating that plans to return people to the moon. In fact, whenever you talk to NASA about this, the one thing they always say is that in this year, 2025, 26, or 27, we're going to land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. So this is their mantra about getting back to the moon. But I think the other thing that we should point out here are two aspects of this that are you know, critically important going forward. One is that when you look at the commercial models for space exploration and space exploitation, there really aren't any working financial models yet that make sense. In other words, yes, you can launch plenty of satellites, but who's really making money at this, you know, on a long-term basis, particularly when we talk about deep space exploration? Is there a financial footing, a financial model that makes sense for an independent company to spend time uh, mining space somehow? And number two, on the other side, you know, as we mentioned earlier, this is challenging. Space is hard. Space is dangerous. Space is deadly. 
And one thing that could help everyone would be if this were a community endeavor instead of a separate endeavor you know, by individual countries. If we could coordinate our efforts together, we could not only share the expense, but we could share the risk as well and share the resources as well. But so far, because of the fact that this is much more about national pride and demonstration of technological superiority, oh yes, and there's the research that goes along with it, you know, mm -hmm. right now we're in a place where we're all trying to do it individually. And General Bat, do you agree with that? Do you hope for more cooperation in the future? I know that India is planning to cooperate with Japan uh, this month on a space uh, program, but there is cooperation there, but it's sort of in bits, isn't it? Do you think that you know, we as a world should space cooperate? Is one domain where there has always been cooperation. And if I look back at the history of our space history, we have been help, uh, our allies have been USA, France, Japan, uh, even Russia. And uh, space is one domain where all nations have cooperated till now. Yes, there is national pride. There was at one time a major competition, uh, the first satellite, the first man landing on the moon and all. Uh, but if you see the International Space Station, it has been a great example of cooperation. And I see cooperations like that in the future also, when we explore the moon or maybe beyond to Mars and wherever. Okay. OK, well, on that very positive note, thank you very much to all our guests for joining us. And General Anil Kumar Bhatt, we wish you the best of luck with the scheduled landing on the south side of the moon on Wednesday. Thanks also to Steve Maron and Derek Pitts. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.